After a long and tumultuous development cycle filled with delays and sketchy demos, publishers Bandai Namco saw fit to finally release the God Eater team's newest creation, Code Vein a game many had taken to calling Anime Souls. A moniker that suits the game well in a twisted mirror kind of way. What you see and feel is familiar, yet still rather different. It was clear from the get-go that Bandai Namco Studios set out to make a game heavily inspired by Dark Souls. So inspired, in fact, that it'd be hard to cover it without drawing allusions to the franchise. In being honest about my opinion, these illusions must be drawn. Although the inspirations they took from Dark Souls mostly work to the game's benefit, there is a good handful of places where it frankly comes off as too derivative, and it tended to really affect my gameplay experience in certain stretches. As a result, this is a review I'm going to struggle with a lot, because ultimately, I do really like the game as I like most Souls-like games. But complaints will come frequently and may sound like they undermine or overshadow the good stuff. It's hard to avoid sounding this way, but I will try to do my best and give all credit to the game where it's due. So let's start our dive into Code Vein by looking at the story. And seeing how narratively similar it is to the Souls games, but also how different it is. We start first with our character creator, a system with enough depth and flexibility that likely by the time you complete your masterpiece of a waifu or husbando, you would have forgotten that there's actually supposed to be a game outside of it. This really is a great character creator and led to a slew of awesome designs shortly after the game's release. Designs which done wonders for the game's marketing, as player after player shared their creations over social networking. The clothing options seem limited at first, and unfortunately there isn't much in the way of controlling body proportions. But through the various color schemes, facial details, and the expansive set of accessories, which can be moved and repositioned all over the body, you can create almost anything your heart desires. Hello, this is Cool Cat. No, not that. I said almost anything. I guess my heart today desired a cinnamon waifu named Tarket. Even though what you have to work with at the start is plenty, seasonal unlocks are also a thing. As you see here, the Halloween clothes were added in the middle of my playthrough. Once in-game, we immediately see how Code Vein takes from its contemporaries, as we learn of the world and our position in it. Abandoning most of the game's terminology to boil this down to something more immediately familiar, we are one of several chosen-type characters, cursed to a cycle of death and rebirth a cycle that causes our characters to forget more of their past each time they are reborn. As we roam around a destroyed and desolate city, we aid the last remnants of humanity in staying alive by supplying them with sacred resources known as blood beads. The land that we play in is trapped in by a red mist, acting sort of like a hurricane, keeping the city in its massive eye. Those within said eye of the hurricane believe that salvation lays beyond the mist, and so our ultimate goal is to find a way to clear the mist and venture to a new life beyond it. Clearly, none of these people have ever seen the movie The Mist, other, other, well, you know what, let's just move on. All of this is very Souls-like, but where Code Vein differs is that it's very much a character-driven story. This isn't a game where uncovering the lore will be done through reading item descriptions and looking at contextual environment landmarks. It's not a game where much of the story is fueled by conjecture or theory, or where the adventure is aimless wandering. Code Vein is decidedly much more straightforward. I mean, hell, they even give you maps and they keep track of how much percent of each zone you've visited. This game isn't designed to get you too lost or send you off on long tangential adventures. Though we as the main character do not speak ourselves, we are instrumental to the characters around us. These characters are all on their own personal journeys to protect what they have and to remember what they lost. Each new zone focuses on a different character whose backstory will be uncovered by collecting hidden and scattered vestiges. Vestiges are more or less trapped memories of our character's past. Upon discovering a vestige, it must be taken to Eo in the central hub to have its hidden lore unlocked. Once unlocked, we enter a dreamlike zone where we walk... ...and only walk... I mean, come on guys, let me roll or something... ...and walk from one scene to the next, listening to how our character's histories unfolded like viewing narrated photographs of their life. The more vestiges you find, the more the world and our characters will begin to make sense. Through these, the lore of the world is uncovered and the story is fed to us like a drip of IV, hydrating this world in a way where even the driest of desert zones begin to feel more vibrant and alive. The average vestige takes about 5-6 to six minutes to walk through, which isn't too long, but if you make as infrequent trips back to the central hub as I did, you'll find they have a tendency to pile up. This, on more than one occasion, has led to me spending entire play sessions just walking through memories. 
it can get tedious and a little boring. If these walks through lore theater sound like boar theater to you, and you just want to jump into this game for the Souls-like action, these vestiges can be skipped. At the end of it all, I found the adventure itself, the combat and exploration, much more engaging than the lore or the characters, but I didn't find the vestiges so uninteresting that I felt compelled to skip them. From the very beginning of your adventure, you kind of already know how it's going to end, and in regards to the overarching narrative, there's not much in the way of surprises. Because of this, the little character arcs kind of become the bread and butter of the story. Though many of the character backstories are tragic and depressing, I personally found it a little hard to care for them, as most of their personalities didn't do anything for me, feeling overly archetypal and shallow from beginning to end. But that is just me. For people who felt pushed out of the Souls games because of the detached story, this is a big step forward in the formula to get you what you're looking for. I just think execution and writing could be tightened up some. So the world itself, how it's built around this cycle of death and rebirth, is pretty much lifted entirely out of the Souls games. It has what's really just a cosmetic change done to its explanation. In this regard, Code Vein can feel incredibly derivative. However, this narrative vehicle is steered in a different direction, where its writing sensibilities are completely unique to Code Vein. Which makes a stark, black and white kind of comparison between Code Vein and Dark Souls misleading at the best. This isn't just anime souls, as that implies way too little distinction between what Code Vein is and what Dark Souls is. I think it does both games a disservice to look at them that way, but it is incredibly understandable why people end up in that camp. Unsurprisingly, we can boil the combat down into two defined groups as well the Dark Souls part and the Code Vein part. So let's take a look at the combat now. Let's start with the Souls side of things as we did before. This is a third-person action-adventure game with Metroidvania exploration elements. Combat is heavy and meticulous, and punishment is the name of the game or at least it's supposed to be. There are many different classes which grant the use of different abilities, and different weapon types do behave differently in combat situations. Now, I'm just a simple folk, see? I don't switch my weapons up too much. I mostly just use my big sword and my bigger sword. It's worth noting as well that there are a lot of weapons in the game and half as much armor, and that all of these can be upgraded and modified using salvaged materials from the game world. This allows you to add different types of elemental damage to your weapons, or just just upgrade their raw stats. Combat controls basically keep in line with what Dark Souls established, but with the button mapping more resembling traditional action games. Your face buttons control your heavy and light attacks as well as your dodges, and although there's no dedicated shields, these gargantuan weapons can be used to block attacks using the shoulder buttons. If you're mid-run, of course your attacks are going to be different than if you were in a standstill. You can also modify your attacks by holding R1 while attacking from a standstill. Further attack modifications can be found in just how you play between the light and heavy attacks, or how long you hold each button for. Though it's easy to fall into a rhythm and just use the same two attacks over and over again, I'd recommend at least checking out your arsenal and seeing if there's anything you can mix into your standard play. Up on the D-pad switches between your two equipped weapons, left and right cycles between items, and down on the D-pad uses the item. Where this game really deviates from the Souls games is how it handles classes and leveling, at least leveling to some extent. First off, leveling is just a flat stat upgrade. Using the haze you collect from killing enemies, you level up at missiles, and every time you level up, the requirement to level up again increases. This is one area I found a little lacking, having preferred the control given to us in Dark Dark Souls games to choose how to invest our stat upgrades and control our builds. In Code Vein, nearly everything you can equip is dependent on your class and not your level or stats. And also, yes, just like Dark Souls, if you die, you drop your haze. And if you die again before getting to your haze drop, then you lose that haze forever. Where this game feels wholly unique is how you get dozens of classes that you can switch between and learn skills in. Like any game collector with a massive backlog, you'll probably never get around to playing with all of these, but the variety and potential is definitely encouraging and appreciated. 
Switching classes is simple and costs nothing to do. Just open your character menu and select it and voila, you've changed classes. Each class has a number of skills, both passive and active, that you learn by spending haze. Although some skills do have deeper requirements than that. Once a skill is learned, it can only be used while that class is active, until it has been used enough, or until you've invested enough additional resources into it, at which point that skill becomes completely unlocked and can be used regardless of your active class. To make sure that you don't stack too many skills and become OP, you are limited to only 4 passive and 8 active skills at any given time. This is more than most people will need, especially since you'll more than likely be going at this game with an online friend or an AI companion. Now, most Souls-like games, I would highly recommend you go at them solo, unless it's your first Souls game and maybe you need the extra leg up trying to get over that learning curve at the start. But I do feel that solo play in Code Vein is the unintended method of play. And although Code Vein can be beaten solo, it does feel uniquely built around the idea of not accomplishing the game alone. By this, I don't mean the game is hard, far from it. In fact, I'd say this is the easiest Souls-like game I've played to date, where half the time I was killing enemies before my AI companion even arrived on scene. This game targets you with hordes more than other Souls-like games, and in that regard it seems designed around having more than one player. But more importantly than that, NPCs have unique dialogue and events if you bring them to the right places. These are things that you can miss easily and not really feel their absence, but they're also things that I don't think you really want to miss. They help shape out the characters and can make some zones way more interesting than they would be otherwise, especially areas that change with EO present. But that's not something I think I should get deeper into. On the note of the zones and their individual designs, however, there's a few things to be noted. And again, two categories here, Dark Souls zones, and Code Vein Zones. The cityscapes and surrounding areas are very clearly Code Vein Zones, but there is one zone I feel is so particularly Dark Souls that it sucked me right out of the experience. The An Orlando of Code Vein. It's one thing to take inspiration, but this is a step too far to me. This crosses from imitation being flattery to imitation just being imitation. This is where Code Vein begins to rub me wrong, and I'll admit, it's because of my background with the Dark Souls games. Seeing this here in a game like this is like seeing green pipes in Flappy Bird. You know it's taken from another game and blatantly copied, and it's hard to shake the feeling that you're playing a shameless copy while you go through it. There is an argument to be made that in Dark Souls it still wasn't really an original idea, and that the visual design was taken from a real life place, and that who knows, maybe the Code Vein devs took inspiration from the same place. But given the genre and many mechanics are near identical, it's past the point of excuses. At least I think it is. This is where it begins coming off as shamelessly derivative, which really sucks because this is one of the better designed areas of the game. It's a little too big and it overstays its welcome, but the layout is brilliant. Even though the game gives you maps to help you navigate, there are so many areas that can only be accessed by dropping off certain innocuous seeming places or by snaking around on long detours to find a hidden switch. Enemy placement is smart, and traps and pitfalls actually work effectively. To put it a certain way, this is where the words of the immortal Frank Drebin ring truest. Like a midget at a urinal, I was going to have to stay on my toes. And staying on your toes is exactly what you need to do here. Now, not every zone in the game was designed with such attention to detail, and some areas feel incredibly small compared to this one. But overall, there is a good amount of variety for the roughly 35 hour runtime, and no area is designed with such a lack of care that it isn't fun to venture through. Unless, of course, you're something of a magic user and require Icor to cast spells, in which case you probably hate the desert area where merely standing in the sand drains your Icor. And we never really talked about that earlier, but Icor is kind of just a little stat that controls how much spells and how much skills you can actually use. It can be recharged in a number of ways, but the way you'll be doing it most is simply through combat. For me, I pretty much tanked everything, so Icor never affected me that much. One area in Code Vein I found sadly lacking was the bosses. Simply put, there's not very many of them, and most of the important ones were way easier than I think they were intended to be. I struggled on maybe three bosses in total. Rocket Moose killed me twice, Thick Thighed Butterfly got me a half dozen times because I wasn't used to the game yet, and Smoan Ornstein roadblocked me for an entire day. I win. Hey, I don't see. Here, dive in. Pretty sneaky, Death. Otherwise, this is a pretty simple game, which might make it the perfect introduction to the genre for those who have been hesitant to dip their toes in after hearing of Dark Souls' reputation. 
So, there we have it again. A lot of the combat ideas are straight out of Dark Souls, and how the battle feels will feel incredibly familiar to anybody who's played any of the Souls games before. This I actually do think is a good thing. The leveling and experience system is almost completely out of Dark Souls. They just strip away your control over individual stat management, which in turn heavily streamlines your armor and weapon equipping capabilities. The classes and skill system is 100% code vein. When everything is put together, it does feel like a rather unique take on the genre. Sadly, some environment designs threaten to take away that unique feeling this game has. But enough on that, let's move on to the technicals. That's... In terms of visuals, this isn't exactly an eye popper. The anime style is nice and colorful, and some lighting effects here and there do help elevate the appeal, but washed out and muddy textures can be found almost anywhere you look. To make matters worse, texture pop-in is abundant, not just when loading into new areas, but even in cutscenes where it should be completely ironed out. We're not quite talking 2000s.com bubble levels of popping here, but it's certainly there and it's noticeable. The culling cone is very tight to the back of your camera, so when enemies or AI companions get caught in it, you will see some extremely distracting artifacts at play. This doesn't happen too often, but it is a little jarring. Occasionally, while venturing around, I did hit weird snags in the frame rate. In combat, every now and then, there would be a frame or two dropping, and in the loading hallways, the frame rate, understandably, completely tanks, making it a little nauseating to look at. Thankfully, these slight frame drops aren't game breakers, and the loading hallways are just loading hallways with nothing in them, so that doesn't matter too much either. The controls are still tight and fluid, which is good. This is the most important thing in a game of this nature. The soundtrack in this game? is damn near god tier. Anybody who's ever so much as started the game and heard the title screen music already knows this. Ladies and gentlemen, this soundtrack is the power of Goshina at work, one of my favorite working composers to date. Sound design is fine, and though NPC chatter can get annoying at times, the English voice cast is actually pretty good, with many familiar voices filling out the cast. Stop that. I do what I want to do, and that's all there is to it. It's just self-deception to feel like you've helped after giving no more than handouts. The only other notable oddity I picked up on was a few segments where subtitles didn't quite match the spoken words. Both of you. All revenants must pay a levy. There are no exceptions. But the game does have a hot spring, so I'm willing to look the other way. Now I know it sounds like I complained a lot, but I really feel like I need a hit on this again. I did actually rather like Code Vein. There's areas that are downright derivative, but putting aside those feelings, or at least regarding them as immaterial, to address this game more objectively, the attention to detail, the layouts of the maps, the combat flow, and the leveling system, it all just makes a really fun game. It's messy in places, sure, but it is a rather budget title, and what they pulled off is easily still worth the playthrough. And I mean, if you're not gonna do it for the Souls-like action, do it for the next level anime physics. Hell, you know, I didn't even really care that many of this game's functions are straight Souls ripoffs. The death and rebirth thing, I'd rather they didn't incorporate into the narrative, but as far as I'm concerned, mechanically, it's one of many ingredients that make up the Souls-like subgenre. Death and rebirth mechanics, Metroidvania maps, weighty combat, death punishments, physical checkpoints by the way of bonfires or missiles. These aren't ideas that should be limited to only one game or one franchise. These are the bones of a budding genre, and the game you create on these bones forms the muscle tissue and skin, and it makes every use of this skeleton look and feel a little different. Sadly, Code Vein took just a little bit more than just the bones of Dark Souls. Though Code Vein isn't exactly a purely original creation in this subgenre, they still pushed enough new mechanics in unique and interesting directions that I can comfortably say I enjoyed my time with it. Hopefully, if we do get a second Code Vein game, we will see more original ideas and less green pipes and flappy bird kind of ideas. But that's all today, folks. If you guys like the video, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. As always, folks. Thanks for watching.